Um, so we've looked at two criticisms of the proof to which I think we can give reasonable responses on Mill's behalf. But I want now to look at two other criticisms to which I think Mill has no comparably effective available response. Uh, Um, the yeah, yeah, that's okay. um, so um, the the first of these is I mean it's actually a criticism Mill is very well aware of. He raises it against himself, right? So um, I mean he does so right in the paragraph immediately following that key third paragraph that we've looked at. Yeah? This is the one that goes from 36 over to 37. He says there, but it, that's happiness, has not by this alone proved itself to be the sole criterion. To do that, it would seem, by the same rule necessary to show, not only that people desire happiness, but that they never desire anything else. Now it is palpable that they do desire things which, in common language, are decidedly distinguished from happiness. They desire, for example, virtue in the absence of vice, no less really than pleasure in the absence of pain. The desire of vir virtue is not as universal, but is as authentic a fact as the desire of happiness. And hence the opponents of the utilitarian standard deem that they have a right to infer that there are other ends of human action besides happiness, and that happiness is not the standard of approbation and disapprobation. So see, what Mill does there is he says, look, the argument of that third paragraph on which we've hitherto been focusing. Um, even if it all works out, there's no, there's no problems with it. All it establishes, as he remarks at the end there, is that happiness is, the general happiness is one of the things that's good. Right? But, he says, you know, that's not what we set out to prove. Right? We didn't set out to prove only that general happiness is one of the things that's good. We set out to prove that it's the only thing that's good. Right? And he says, the obvious way to prove that sort of using the procedure that relies on the argument of that paragraph would be to say that the only thing people desire for its own sake is their own happiness. But then he says, but look, there's a problem with that. I mean, it's apparently false, right? I mean, people seem to desire stuff other than happiness. They desire, for instance, as he says, virtue in the absence of vice. People want to be good people, right? They don't just want to be happy. So there's, you know, apparent counter-evidence to the claim that you got to defend if you're going to um, use the argument found in that third paragraph to establish what Mill sets out to establish. All right, so um, if we go to PowerPoint briefly, I've got a, um, a formulation of this criticism. Of course, this one Mill knows all about. He raises it against himself.
right. Um, so, um, Mill knows about this criticism, criticism, and he has a way of addressing it. Indeed, I mean, if you look sort of in terms of uh, number of paragraphs, the bulk of the chapter is really devoted to Mill's response to this problem. Yeah. Uh, there are more issues about the response than we'll track, but I mean, you can get the basic idea by seeing two suggestions that Mill makes about things like virtue, right? He also, I mean, he talks about the desire of virtue in the bit we read. He talks later about the desire for money, right? So he talks about th things that we appear to desire, which seem to be different from happiness. So they seem to be counterexamples to the claim that the only thing we really desire is happiness. What Mill wants to say is that in any of these cases, the thing is really desired either as a means to happiness or as a part of happiness. And that, therefore, the only thing we really desire for its own sake is happiness. Mill is thus committed in this somewhat distinctive way to defending um, a view that gets called in the literature on this psychological hedonism, the idea that the only thing we desire or desire for its own sake is happiness. Um, this is another element of Mill's discussion of which more is highly critical. Moore, in particular, makes fun of the idea that things other than happiness could be desired, quote, as part of happiness. He makes fun of it applied to the example of money. Moore says, according to Mill, you know, this physical money, these coins and notes and whatnot, these physical items are desired as part of this mental state, happiness. But, you know, how could that be, he says, right? How could a you know, physical object like this money be part of a mental state? I actually don't think that's a particularly good criticism either, right? I think um, if you draw on the right kind of views in the philosophy of mind, you can actually make decent sense of the idea that uh, physical items could be in uh, the way that Mill needs them to be sort of part of a mental state. I don't, I don't in the end think that that's, that's terribly troubling. But I still think um, As it were, Moore is on the right side here and Mill is on the wrong side. Um, seems to me the best, um, best things to say about psychological hedonism um, take us back to uh, our discussions earlier on of psychological egoism and of... Um, Joseph Butler, the most famous critic of psychological egoism. Because I think sort of a version of Butler's line is right here. Okay, so look. Um, the way to see it is this. The psychological hedonist is the person who thinks there's a general connection between desire and happiness, and it's this. The only object of desire there ever is, is happiness. Happiness is the only, well, the only thing that's intrinsically desired. The only thing that's ever desired for its own sake is happiness. Butler, in effect, suggests if there is any kind of general connection between desire and happiness, it's something else, right? The general connection is if you get what you desire, that brings you satisfaction. But 
Butler wants very clearly to say, that doesn't mean that the object of desire, the thing you desire, is always satisfaction or happiness. It isn't, right? You desire other stuff as well. To my mind, um, Butler's view there, the sort of anti-psychological hedonist view, is much more sensible than Mill's. Yeah. So, I, you know, to express it again, the thought would be, if there is a general connection between desire and happiness, it's not the one that Mill wants. It's not the one happiness is, is the only thing that's ever an object of desire. The connection instead is something different. The connection is, um, if you get what you desire, that makes you happy. But that general connection is not one that properly supports the psychological hedonism Mill needs here. Turn now then to a, a fourth and final criticism. This one in effect we already previewed in contrasting the way Mill um, characterizes utilitarianism in the proof chapter immediately before setting out to prove it with what he says in characterizing utilitarianism earlier in the book. Right. And what it kind of brings out in a way is the, I mean it's the difference in the way Mill views the core of utilitarianism from the way that contemporary philosophers tend to do so. So the idea is this, right? The idea is um, as, and we'll see more about this next time, as many contemporary philosophers see it, sort of the core utilitarian idea is consequentialism. Right? But, you know, Mill's proof doesn't do anything really to show you that consequentialism is right. So, I mean, at least given that way of seeing it, Mill's proof doesn't really get to the heart of defending the key utilitarian idea. So I, again, I've got a little expression of this for you on a PowerPoint, if we can slip over that.
All right. Um, so here I think there is no good quick response, right? Um, I mean, it's not that the proof involves some way of defending consequentialism that's not obvious on the surface. It, it doesn't involve any way of defending consequentialism. Uh, I mean, you know, there, there, there probably is interesting historical work to do in explaining why Mill thinks the core of the utilitarian view is hedonism and the contemporary uh, utilitarians tend, by contrast, to think that the core is consequentialism. But um, that's not something it's sensible for us to pursue. Yeah. So the next thing to do then is to turn to that contemporary debate, the contemporary debate that focuses on consequentialism, focuses on the difference between on the one hand the sort of pro-utilitarians who accept consequentialism and on the other hand the anti-utilitarians who think that consequentialism is in some crucial way misconceived. Right? And that's what we'll do next time, so we're, we're done for today.